To make a move like that, you have to have kahunas and conviction. Long term, I'm bullish. We could see about a 20% correction next year. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. Don't touch that dial. So I have kids zero, uh, one, age one to 14. Maybe I'm selfish here, but how do I build that uh, drive for my kids? Josh, let me say that the core of a long journey for a family lies in its capacity to make joint decisions. Families have to be, as Webster defines us, as two or more people. So you can have a single-person household, but you can't, in the dictionary, have a single-person family. It has to be two or more people. So the core of a family's journey, as opposed to an individual's journey, is the capacity to make multiple joint decisions over a very long period of time. That's the actual process that lies underneath the, and is the practice of the philosophy I'm discussing this morning if a family wants to flourish. How do you build a joint decision-making system in your children? They have to have affinity, positive connection with each other, not simply blood. Blood's actually only useful if you're in the emergency room and you're hemorrhaging. That was taught to me years ago by a great man. The real question of the bond of a family, bonds of a family, are affinity, the bonds that the parents create when they marry or form a union through some other process. That bond of affinity must be the energy that continues so that the process, not only of your children, but when they marry or they form unions, the person who's choosing to join your family feels that affinity and joins that affinity. What is affinity? Affinity is the positive connecting word in the English language for every art and science, positive connections of two things. Because affinity, positive connection of two things, creates fusion. One plus one makes three, the, law, the great force of our universe for positive, our force of our sun. So if we start with the fact that we must have a joint decision-making system over a long period of time, and that that joint decision-making has to be bound, bind it, bound by affinity, that is, people feel a desire to join it, that is the thing which the family must most seek to do. Now, you're going to ask, of course, well, how? If I knew how, uh, well, I wouldn't be bothering you. I'd just say, okay, we figured it out. Nobody knows how. Because it's a journey of a thousand miles, has so many steps in it to get to the fourth or fifth generation successfully. So how do we increase the bonds of affinity? That's the question that everyone wants to know. My answer to that, which is an ancient, I would say, uh, philosophical position, is that the, that the actions of a family must be this. The family must seek in all interactions with each other to enhance the happiness of each individual member of the family. So it must seek, and I say it again, see, vision, act toward a process with every interaction seeks to enhance the journey of the individual member of the family toward the entire family flourishing. Now, that's a lot of words for me. The listeners are looking for something practical, so I'll just say this. When I lived on Long Island, um, I had boats. And I did have a boat that sank. So the image I offer to families is this. If you are seeking to enhance the individual journey of happiness of every member toward the family flourishing, I'm repeating it on purpose, what you're actually doing is saying every boat must rise and no boat must sink. So we will put our intention and our actions toward that single principle. Are all the boats rising, which means our the individual journeys of happiness of each member being our goal and intention. So all boats rise and none sink. So how do you do that in 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 estate planning today? Mm -hmm. You talk to most attorneys and they split everything up. So when the patriarch or matriarch dies, you have three kids, Manny, Mo, and Jack. Uh, the, the money split three ways, a third, a third, a third. That seems very different than what you're kind of advocating, where they all agree on decisions. Not that they're all going to agree, but there, there, there's some dynamism where 
they have a common goal, shared mission, et cetera. Well, let's look at it this way again. If we take the hand gesture, if what they see, Josh, is split it three ways, get money, and go on your way, then there's no intention in that plan to create a, fam a, a family. There's just an inheritance. Uh, I would call it a uh, an act, a transfer. It's not a gift. It happens because you happen to be somebody's child. There's no family energy there, just as you said yourself. There's no energy there. No, that's the end. So it's what not most today. people do is really counterintuitive to building that family unity then. Yeah, what they're looking to, and so let's be a little more sophisticated. The vast majority of families in the West, not the, the uh, civil law countries of, in Europe and Asia, but in the America, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, the civil, the common law countries, let's be very clear. If a family lasts for three generations, that minimum period, 90% of the financial capital will be in trust. That's true. And if you've just got a couple million dollars, it's going to be in, in trust. So there's a combination of issues. One is the heirs actually don't get the money. The heirs get a structure which now complicates further their relation, personal relationships because now they have this legal relationship imposed upon them. I'm writing a book, a new book with two colleagues, in which we're going to ask the question, can the family live in the plan? I've asked over 150 advisors now and different people in all the different professions that serve families. Not one person, Josh, has answered that question. Yes, so the plan, because the plan has no culture. Those trusts are simply created to avoid creditors, save taxes, and be a monument to the person who took the energy and made it matter. But nobody gives any thought to what it's like for a human beings to live in that structure. So, of course, they can't live in the structure because nobody considered them doing so. So this is a more complicated question, my new friend, than just three people get money, because that's not what happens. The planning process creates structures, and those structures have no culture. They have no purpose, except to avoid taxes, avoid creditors, and be a monument to a dead person. Wow, that's a real indictment. This field is a mess. That's why I'm trying, as best I can, to bring to life what I call qualitative estate planning instead of quantitative estate planning. I'm trying to bring to life thoughts from the planner's part of how does my plan assist that affinity group of human beings who want to be together. If they don't, so what? That, that just goes back to energy. There's nothing wrong. Nobody's hurt. But if they do want to stay together, do the structures support their being together? Mm. Or do they make it more complicated? You feel that? Yeah, that's good. But I've only heard one or two people talk about, no, I'm bringing it to the tactical. You you have yeah. the spiritual, but, but that's because I agree with you on that. Without spiritual <laughs> cohesion, joint mission, val shared values, it's all going to crumble. But mm -hmm. when you go to you know, estate planners and you say, you know what, I want to do a pot trust, you know, where everything's kind of, I, I heard this conversation, I don't know, like 10, 15 years ago about kind of keeping it all in the family, having family retreats and mission statements. And uh, it was very Im impactful to me. And then I talked to a uh, leading estate planning attorney about it. And eh, they kind of poo-pooed it. What are the structures that might allow that family culture to live and breathe from a tactical oh. standpoint? Yeah. Well, Josh, let's start from that technical standpoint with the advisor who poo pooed it. So when we say we're a state Top planning. Top estate planning in the ter uh, you know, advisor in the country. Uh, yes, and I'm not debating with that person. And I agree, by say. the way. Th theoretically, I agree with you, not them. But okay. you, you go, so you good. listen to you. You listen to Family Wealth. Uh, there's another guy, right. Lee Brower. There was another guy, right. a couple people like you, but very few. You hear a talk, you're wowed, you say, hey, I want this kind of, I, I've been researching this for 15 years, the 100-year plan, kind of studying Eastern cultures. And, right. Right. Uh, you know, you want a family culture to last. So for us, my, my family, we all have a certain character about us, you know. Uh, yes, we have a certain way of discipline. We have a certain way of conflict. 
We have a certain way of, you know, loyalty, you know, different principles that sort of govern my immediate family. And we want to build that, my wife and I, for generations. But it's very difficult because then once you go to create, uh, uh, Mr. Attorney, I want to create this structure. And they go, well, you know, it doesn't really work. Work like that. Uh, very costly and blah, blah, blah. And you shouldn't do it. And that, that's what I'm trying to say. That like, yes. Okay. So let me see if I can offer this to our wonderful watchers and listeners. When you choose an advisor to help you, the advisor needs to be very clear with you whether his or her interest is in taxes and creditors or in the dynamic preservation of your family. That's a question you as a client must ask and ask for an honest answer. If he or she, this quote planner person, is basically interested in taxes and avoiding creditors, fine. Then you may go back to them after you find someone who's actually interested in the dynamic preservation of your family. Work with the person who's interested in the dynamic preservation of your family, the qualitative questions that we are addressing this morning, then go back to the quantitative person and have a structure that creates that. Don't argue with the person, but don't stay in the office until you've all gone and found someone who's actually interested, Josh, in the process that you and your wife and children are developing. Now, let me give you one very practical way that people think about this. I said a little while ago that the core practice process of a family that seeks to reach its fifth generation, go on from there, big aspiration, is making good joint decisions over a long period of time. By the way, that's all governance is. Governance is not boxes and writings. It's making joint decisions. So here's a very practical thing that a planner seeking to help a family dynamically preserve itself would suggest. Okay, if you really want to try this, Please find someone, and there are loads of very good people, who will do a learning styles assessment. Now, let's not get into arguments with the academy about this work journey. Just accept for the moment that you can find out how you learn. Everybody from the age of six can find out how he or she learns. Well, if we're a family that's going to grow our human intellectual, spiritual, and social self, isn't it almost imperative, a requirement? Each of us knows how we learn, not only so we can learn best in school, but through all those years that we're going to be making decisions together, we'll be getting information from wherever the sources are of our advisors in the way we can best understand it and integrate it. So then when we come to the decision-making process, everybody in the room knows we're prepared. Well, that's as simple as that, and that's a $5,000 job, by the way, for 20 people. And by the way, I also bring the trustees to that session. The future trustees or the existing trustees, they come too because they need to know in enhancing the lives of the beneficiaries, which is raising the boat through the trust, how that person learns. Of course they do. How else can they communicate? This is not rocket science. This is using the science of human development in the systems that we have in this wonderful world we're living in so that we're increasing our human capital then we increase our intellectual, then we make better decisions, and we have a purpose to get to our fifth generation. If the people want to, that's an intention. But the problem of the planning is the planning, if the planner isn't intellectually and spiritually, him or herself, interested in the dynamic preservation issues, then get out of the room. Don't stay in that room. But maybe go back to them. I want to say it again for taxes and creditors and structures once you have a culture made that those structures will support. 